Well, Tom, ma mainly my background has been in the, for the last about 12 or 14 years in the urban development field. Um, I spent 12 years building condominiums, working with some of the larger uh, multifamily developers in the Vancouver area. Prior to that, though, I, I did some different things. Um, I, I worked in politics and public policy for eight years, both on Parliament Hill in Ottawa and in the, in the political sector in Victoria. And then prior to that, I was a journalist. So I've, in the business I'm in today, I spend a lot of time working with um, people that are dealing with tough urban issues, um, primarily urban development issues. So I try and combine sort of my three past careers and uh, provide some help and advice in that field. I would say that the, the big challenge is going to be accommodating the, the growth that's, that we're continuing to experience here in, in Vancouver and in BC, and I don't think that growth is going to um, is going to drop off in any big way when you look at the long-term trends. It's this part of the world, Canada, um, the, the Pacific Coast, our climate, our economy, and so on. It's a pretty attractive place to live. Um, the world's becoming a much smaller place with the kinds of uh, immigration patterns that we're seeing, especially from the Asian part of the world. And so I think Canada and British Columbia specifically and Vancouver in particular are going to experience continued growth pressures and I think one of the big challenges is how do we accommodate that growth without affecting the quality of life that brought people here in the first place and I think one of the ways of doing that is to look at how we plan our, our communities and to look at how we can accommodate higher density development. So do you think we're designed to accommodate that? Do you think the city's uh, ready to, to bring in um to accommodate this change that you see is coming our way regardless? I'm not sure that the mindset is there yet. I think we've um, we've broken some new ground in the way that we've planned parts of our city, especially the, the downtown. What we've seen happen in the downtown over the last 10 years, I think, is really um, it's precedent-setting stuff in North America in terms of the kind of urban development patterns that we've seen and bringing people back in to, to live in the downtown and to to play and, and work in the downtown and having that downtown community. I think we've done some great things in that area. I think some of the outer, the inner ring suburbs, as, as I would call them, the, the, the areas outside the downtown within the city of Vancouver, um, there are some nodes and some neighborhoods where we've been able to accommodate um, some some new growth. Um, for instance, the, the old um, Carling O'Keefe site on um, in, the, in the Arbutus area, I think we've done a great job of transforming that site. Um, the Fraser Lands uh, along Marine Drive we've done a great job with but I think there are other neighborhoods where we need to we need to look at how we can better accommodate higher density development and, and transform some of those traditionally um, single-family neighborhoods into you know more multi-family type neighborhoods that can accommodate growth so when you look at the single-family neighborhoods what sort of uh, it, um, what sort of challenges uh, if you want to increase well, let's say increase density but let's just or let's say we want to just make it more livable for the different kinds of people that are coming to Vancouver now. What sort of challenges do we have to overcome in order to accommodate new people in these neighborhoods? I think the biggest challenge we have to overcome is the mindset of the existing residents. And I think it's largely influenced by, I think, a, a misperception or, or a, a misunderstanding of what density is all about. And that misunderstanding creates an enormous amount of fear. Um, when you go into uh, single-family neighborhoods and you talk about introducing multifamily into those neighborhoods, you get an immediate backlash from residents who fear change. And um, the kinds of things they fear, though, I believe are exactly the kinds of things that higher density quality development addresses. Uh, for instance, one of the big concerns that residents have are, is they're going to lose their sense of privacy and they're going to lose the, the neighborhood feel of the, uh, of the area. And I believe that, number one, we can plan better communities and increase the sense of public or of, of privacy within your home and still enhance the, the public realm and have more social interaction in the neighborhood than, the, than there's there today. Uh, well, no, and that's a very that's a very good concept is to have eyes on the street, for instance, and have ground-oriented housing where people can actually get to know their neighbors. Let's take one extreme and compare that with the, the extreme that I think is is one of the worst forms of planning. That's what we see in the outer ring suburbs as you move further away from the downtown and into the suburbs, and you see these subdivisions with um, you know the the long curvilinear streets, the lack of sidewalks within those subdivisions, and then all you see is row after row or house after house of garage doors and you you know you have the homeowner drive home push the button uh, the remote control drive into their uh, garage close the door walk into their their darkened computer room and sit in front of the screen and maybe converse with somebody half the world away but they don't even know who's living next door nor have they seen their neighbor in the last three weeks <laughs> so 
But why is it so attractive, though? Why are the suburbs so attractive uh, to people? And they continue to be uh, a great place for developers to invest money, and uh, and people seem to be buying up the land. I'm not sure they're attractive. They happen to be right now the only, the, and they have been in the last um, in the last number of decades, the only form of housing that was available. But look at what's happened in Greater Vancouver over the last um, the last uh, say 15 years. We've seen a shift in sales of new homes from largely it was. 60% single family homes and about 40% multifamily homes 10 years ago and today I would say that shift is, is, is the exact opposite maybe even greater we're seeing between 60 and 65% of the homes that are being sold today as multifamily homes and about 35 to 40% as single family homes a lot of that has to do with the pressure on our land base you know, we live in a, a constrained valley. We don't have an unlimited supply of land, so we're having to look at other options just as a result of that. The other is affordability. You know, the, as the land becomes uh, more scarce, prices are rising, and as demand continues, prices rise even further. So some of those things are definitely changing in the marketplace. Uh, well, no, and that's a very that's a very good concept is to have eyes on the street, for instance, and have ground oriented housing where people can actually get to know their neighbors. Let's take one extreme and compare that with the, the extreme that I think is is one of the worst forms of planning. That's what we see in the outer ring suburbs as you move further away from the downtown and into the suburbs, and you see these subdivisions with um, you know the the long curvilinear streets, the lack of sidewalks within those subdivisions, and then all you see is row after row or house after house of garage doors and you you know you have the homeowner drive home push the button uh, the remote control drive into their uh, garage close the door walk into their their darkened computer room and sit in front of the screen and maybe converse with somebody half the world away but they don't even know who's living next door nor have they seen their neighbor in the last three weeks <laughs> so what but why is it so attractive, though? Why are the suburbs so attractive uh, to people? And they continue to be uh, a great place for developers to invest money, and uh, and people seem to be buying up the land. I'm not sure they're attractive. They happen to be right now the only, the, and they have been in the last um, in the last number of decades, the only form of housing that was available. But look at what's happened in Greater Vancouver over the last um, the last uh, say 15 years. We've seen a shift in sales of new homes from largely it was six. 60% single family homes and about 40% multifamily homes 10 years ago and today I would say that shift is, is, is the exact opposite maybe even greater we're seeing between 60 and 65% of the homes that are being sold today as multifamily homes and about 35 to 40% as single family homes a lot of that has to do with the pressure on our land base you know, we live in a, a constrained valley. We don't have an unlimited supply of land, so we're having to look at other options just as a result of that. The other is affordability. You know, the, as the land becomes um, more scarce, prices are rising, and as demand continues, prices rise even further. So some of those things are definitely changing in the marketplace. Well, before we talk about specific examples, let's say there is no easy answer to affordability because we're working within the market of supply and demand. And that market of supply and demand is, is regulated by a number of things within our own local market and we're in the world marketplace as well. This is still a quality of life place to live and that's why people are coming here and the demand is continuing. So we have to recognize that to start with. But then we have to look at relative affordability. What can we do to provide housing options that are more affordable than others? And, you know, take for example a development that I was involved with about um, about seven or eight years ago in a single family neighborhood traditional single family neighborhood just off of commercial drive uh, at the corner of gravely and mclean uh, we took what was traditionally a, you know a, a typical uh, lot in that area 33 by 120 foot lot we consolidated it with a um, with a lot next door one of the lots was a corner lot they they had for probably the last 70 years two houses on them we took those, that 66 by 120 foot site and we developed six new homes on that site. We put the parking underground and it's expensive to do that. So, you know, when we're talking about affordability, you've got to look at the costs of, of building these homes. There's trade-offs to be made. But what we were able to do is we were, we were able to create six new homes on two lots that traditionally had two homes on them. And we were able to build the kinds of homes and these, these are row houses um, ranging in size from 1,450 square feet up to about 19. 1,850 square feet. Those homes, three-story homes with parking underneath, were able to provide, uh, you know, quality living space. 
a beautiful public realm around the building, not a lot of yard space and so on, but well-developed space. And we were also able to provide enough flex space within the home that somebody could actually work from their home as well, the way we configured the floor plan. There was space for an office and a, a space to work within the home. So there's a housing option that's a little more affordable than what traditionally was in that neighborhood, and it made much better use of the land that was available there, and it didn't change the character of the neighborhood. It fit well, in with the neighborhood. Well, yeah. Well, what did the neighbors think of all this? I mean, uh, the... the Reaction? There wasn't, uh, you know, one of the one of the things we did is we focused on making sure that the design of the project did not compromise the quality of, of the types of homes that were in the neighborhood. And there's a number of heritage homes in that neighborhood, and we tried to emulate some of the architectural character there to to take cues from the heritage architecture there. We made sure that the, the massing of the building wasn't so massive that it overwhelmed the neighboring ho homes in the area. We dealt with setbacks, for instance, um, along the street and made sure that the kind of setback we had was similar to the setback of the, the other homes that formed the, the pattern along that street. All of these issues can be addressed to deal with neighbors' concerns. I think there was some fear at the time that, you know, you're bringing a lot more people into the neighborhood and you're going to create a lot more traffic and so on. But, you know, that neighborhood, for instance, is three blocks from a main high street, commercial drive, where there's a lot of pedestrian activity. So, you know, that, again, is the kind of area that you should be encouraging this kind of density in. And I think if you go and talk to neighbors there now, you'll find out that they're quite pleased with the results of that, that transformation. Um, it's, well, how about... Uh you were able to solve the parking problem, and uh, I guess it was transit a problem for people using those uh, those homes, or was that it's a fairly again? There's two main streets nearby, First Avenue and Commercial Drive, are within a few blocks walking distance, and you know those are main transit areas. I wish we didn't have to build the parking ratio that we had to build. Uh, we I think we built two parking stalls per unit. I would much have preferred to build say 0.75 parking stalls per unit because I think the area is one where you could encourage more pedestrian uh, activity. We tend to today to focus on the car as number one concern and traffic is the big concern and I think we should be talking about quality of life and quality of housing before we talk about accommodating the car. Well, I think one of the choices you have to make is is what's within your community. What kind of um, what kind of amenities, what kind of quality of life can you experience within the surrounding neighborhood? Uh, go out to the outer ring suburbs and look what you've got to offer in terms of what I call public realm, the public space, the space that isn't part of somebody's yard. Sure, there's nice big backyards, lushly landscaped, and you, you might have a patio and so on, but what do you have in front of your home? You've probably got a lot of blacktop and a bunch of cars parked in front. Um, you probably are not with Within walking distance of shopping, you're probably going to have to get in your car and drive, you know, three to ten minutes to the nearest shopping. Your kids are probably having to be driven to school. School's maybe far enough to walk, but you're not sure with the traffic that's on the road that you want your kids walking to school. Most likely, you're not working very close to your home. You're probably commuting at least 15, 20 minutes, maybe 45 minutes, maybe an hour to, to where you work. Whereas if you live within a highly densified neighborhood that has a mix of uses, you're not commuting, you're probably finding life a lot easier. You probably know your neighbors because you're spending a lot more time out in the on the street and in the public areas of your community. So I think that's the kind of assessment you have to make when you look at the effects of density. And life is, is really a lot of doing more with less, isn't it? It's, uh, you, you live in a, maybe a slightly smaller place that's maybe slightly more expensive than the suburbs, but the question is what do you get for that? And you're saying that that brings the public amenities and the livability of it is, uh, should be appealing for people uh, to make it attractive. I think smaller can be better. Smaller can be better. I think that, you know, let's just talk about the kind of fine grain of, of, of uh, design that you can put into a smaller home, the, the better use of space within that home, the, the better use of the, the public space outside, the way you landscape it, the way you use the, the public areas outside immediately surrounding the home, and then the, the neighborhood. What, you know, one of the things that we don't do a great job of uh, in, in our, in our um, traditional planning over the last uh, half a century is accommodating a range of uses in the same neighborhood. Um, you know, 50 years ago we started to decide that it was best to separate uh, uses and commercial uses would go in one area, residential uses would go in another, office would go in another, industrial in another. Well, we're starting to understand again that that really doesn't work. Uh, it doesn't provide for interesting, lively places to live. It encourages people to get in their car and drive between places. It makes much more sense if we can bring some of those uses together and combine them and have within walking distance a whole range of uses.
Well, first of all, it's providing a housing option in a single-family neighborhood that wouldn't otherwise be there, and it's helping address this issue of affordability, both for the person who's renting the suite and also for the person who owns the home who's who's getting the revenue to be able to afford to, to, to live in that home. I'm amazed at how the transition from in terms of the regulation over um, secondary suites was handled in Vancouver. I don't know how long ago that it was that we last dealt with the issue, probably 15 to 20 years ago, but there was a lot of opposition position to legalizing secondary suites and the debate that's gone on recently to allow a change in regulation to accommodate secondary suites was without much opposition at all and I think it's just a recognition that it works you know the neighborhoods that have secondary suites the homes that have them it works in the neighborhood and people need that that form of housing is a much needed form of housing and it's densifying the neighborhood without that fear of that ugly word, D word, density. I mean, in fact, it's taking a home that was traditionally single family and it's turning it into a multifamily home, at least a two family home. And, you know, the neighbors might resist what they would call density and traditionally perceived to be density, but that's what you're doing. You're densifying uh, low density neighborhoods. Yeah. Are there other kinds of, of infill that you like uh, as well that you think are good? You did a row house project here that's uh, obviously was quite successful. Well, I think the, the infill that we're seeing in the downtown with the, the high-rise towers and, and especially with the podium development and the, and the townhouses around them is a form of density that's really worked in, in that area in the downtown. Um, I think some of the townhouse developments that we've seen, as I mentioned a lot, in the Fraser View lands, uh, the row housing format there has worked very well. Um, you know, we, we've seen some some four-story wood frame developments and, and, and uh, other types of mid-rise developments in neighborhoods like the Arbutus lands. I think that, that development is, has been a, a great success and it's, it's introduced a mix of, of uses. And then some of the other neighborhoods where along, um, along major arterials where we've had commercial development and then we've now seen the three stories of residential above. I think of, for instance, uh, Fourth Avenue. There's been a number of developments, everything from the, 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 the great development uh, that we call the Capers development at Fourth and Vine and as you move further um, further west along 4th Avenue, a lot of the, the new development along there and some of it along uh, Broadway as well. I think those have been successful projects. So those kind of projects, uh, I mean, is, do you feel the city uh, and the city staff and the city politicians sort of lead the way on that or, or are they uh, in the way? That's an interesting question. Who's responsible for transformation in Vancouver of the of the way we plan our neighborhoods? You know, I think it's been a collaboration. There's been resistance at certain times when new ideas are brought forward, and sometimes those new ideas came from the development community, and sometimes they came from innovative planners that are thinking outside the box and you know sometimes you end up with um, some resistance to that at the political level because neighborhoods react but the successes that we've um, that we've experienced they've been they've been a collaborative effort i don't think any one group or any one person can take credit for it i think we've got some some great planners in city hall who've been willing to think outside the box um, i wish the process was a little more streamlined but we have to recognize that it is you know, a public process, and they, the the city has to deal with a whole range of, of pressures from from all kinds of quarters, all kinds of stakeholders, and so on. Um, and we've seen a lot of activity in the last uh, number of years. The process, um, in terms of time is a concern because of affordability. When we talk about housing affordability, time is money. So if we could speed up the process and, and have a more streamlined process of approving developments, then maybe we can bring the affordability equation a little closer to reality. Uh, but I think that will come with time as people start to understand what the effects of growth are. Affordability, uh, the, the, uh it doesn't escape our attention. A lot of people wring their hands over uh, affordability and say what a problem it is. but Pretty much every property owner in the city who's seen their values go up by 25 to 40 percent in the last two years, uh, they're really crying crocodile tears. Uh, it doesn't seem to be that big. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of people that are actually very happy to see the price of land continue to go up in the in the city. Is that a, a dynamic that uh, that uh, causes you concern? 
you know, I, I guess you have to look at it realistically in terms of where is that value. And, and someone that owns their own home, and they've seen that price increase a tremendous amount over the last couple of years, that value is locked in their home. It's locked in the equity they have in their home or in the, in the financing that they've been able to leverage out of that home. They're not recognizing, they're not realizing that value. They may recognize the value is there, but they're not realizing if they sell that home and they have to then replace that accommodation with something else, they're also moving into a market where prices are rising. So, you know, the the issue of whether or not um, people's greed for the value in their home is fueling this this price rise. Um, for existing homeowners, I'm not sure that's the case. I think what's pushing prices up is the fact that there's huge demand. There's people are coming here and wanting to live here. Low interest rates sustained over a period that we've never seen before, this long period of low interest rates, has, in, has encouraged people to move out of the rental market and buy. Look what's happening to rental rates today. We've never seen the kind of vacancy rates that, we've, that we're starting to see in, in the rental market today, and that's because people are saying, why should I pay eight or nine or a thousand dollars, eight or nine hundred a month or a thousand dollars a month in rent when I can take that same amount, maybe add two hundred dollars to it and pay a mortgage payment at a, you know, four and a quarter percent interest rate and own my own home and build some equity in it. In terms of built form, I think you're starting to see a transformation. Um, when you go back and look 15 or 20 years ago, you didn't see the kind of uh, development that we see in the downtown today with a high-rise tower that has ground-oriented units around the base of it. Um, I think that's an innovative form of housing that was was um, created to address the issue of what does the streetscape look like when you put a large tower and you, you densify on a small lot. So, you know, there's a there's something that was a transformation based based on, on trying to do to design something that, that was better for the community. In terms of the, t the housing types that we're seeing, um, you know, one of the big things is to try and create some ground-oriented housing, to create more ground-oriented housing at a higher density level. The way that we do that has to change, I think, over time. Uh, for instance, one of the, the things that I think we need to look at is we need to look at fee simple townhouses. Um, if you go back and look at a number of the the larger cities in, in eastern Canada and the eastern seaboard of the U.S. For a century, they've had row housing that's been fee simple. People have owned their own home and they own lo their own lot, even though the unit was attached on either side to another unit. We've traditionally here had strata living, strata development for that type of thing. We're only now seeing developers start to look at the, the fee simple townhouse option uh, and the legal framework to allow for that. And I think it allows for a much less complicated form of, of regulation around how people live with each other. I think as we've seen a shift from single family to multifamily over the last decade and a half, we've also seen a much more complicated living arrangement commonly with other neighbors and I think people are, are, are seeing some frustration around that. And that was exacerbated by the leaky condo problem and the fact that, you know, owners had to get together and sort out some major costly problems together. And um, we're finding that that added a lot of pressure to the kind of lifestyle people experienced in multifamily housing. So if there's one thing that that will impact, I believe it's going to impact the kind of, of housing that we design in the future at that multifamily level. And I think one of the solutions to, to a, a, a less complex type of, of arrangement is this uh, fee simple row house or fee simple townhouse. You know what the green building question is going to come down to? It's going to come down to what is the homeowner willing to trade off? It's really not in the hands of developers to make that decision. It's in the hands of homeowners. Let me give you a little bit of an example. Um, I was working in a suburb where um, they're moving to a, a more dense form of single family home on a small lot, 33 foot lot, where traditionally they had a large lot with a front driveway. When they, they carved these lots up into smaller lots, they wanted to avoid having a whole bunch of driveways entering onto a major arterial road. So they encouraged that a lane be built in the, in the rear of these to, and, and the lane be shared by a number of homes for access of, for the car. Um, the city initially came up with a standard for that lane that was pretty similar to the standard of the road up front. Curbs on both sides, a paved surface, um, built-in drainage, street lighting, all things that probably aren't very sustainable from an environmental point of view. You know, the drainage is is not being um, is not is not permeating back into the the, the groundwater is not permeating back into the ground. Um, pa large paved surfaces are not are not 
healthy for green living. Uh, you know, the curbs are the concrete curbs are expensive and and consume a lot of energy to produce. All of that type of thing. The lighting, you know, uses energy. When the developers um, we're looking at, you know, what are some of the options to to try and deal with that alternatives to that? And they started talking to the city to bring the cost down. They were faced with the reality, you know, for instance, if I put gravel in that um, in that lane instead of a paved surface, and I don't put any um, fixed drainage system, I just allow the water to run off naturally and seep back into the ground. I'm going to end up probably in a heavy rainfall with some standing water in the in the lane for a period of time, maybe for a couple of hours. You're going to have some puddles in the lane, and they really believed that they were not going to be able to overcome the concerns that residents would have about puddles sitting in the lane. They weren't going to be able to overcome the perception that a new homeowner might have come, might have coming to look at that and seeing that. And the city felt that they'd end up with too many phone calls from people on rainy days saying, look, there's a puddle in my lane. That's the kind of thing we're going to have to overcome if we're going to move to green building. I think homeowners are going to have to realize that there's a benefit to be derived from building more responsibly uh, and treating the environment more responsibly, but there's also some trade-offs. There's some cost trade-offs, monetary cost trade-offs, and there's some cost trade-offs in terms of the way you live. I'm not sure that homeowners are ready for all of those yet. I think if you look at public opinion, some of the surveys that I've seen recently, people are saying, yes, I want to be more environmentally responsible. But when you ask them, are, we, are you willing to pay more for that? Or are you willing to make some sacrifices for that? No, they're not willing to do that. So there's a lot of focus today on sustainable development and green building technology. But I'm not sure that the consumers caught up with that. I think that may be by advocates and, and people who are more knowledgeable and informed about it than, than the consumer is. So who can who can really lead that discussion though? You know, it's like it's the this is the perennial problem with new information. I mean, is it up to the developers to lead us through that, or do we need uh, does the CMHC need to take a leadership on that? Or uh, uh, I mean, I guess it comes from all. It's going to be an evolutionary process. Um, part of it will be education, and I think the development community is definitely on board and wanting to do this more responsibly. They, they, they believe it; it's the right thing to do. I think that you know, city governments are tar are starting to be more responsible, and I think that you know, the regulatory environment nationally, internationally with um, you know, with the Kyoto Protocol and other things are pushing governments to look at this in a more proactive way. But never forget, we live in a free market economy where supply and demand and market forces are going to drive it. And until consumers wake up and understand it, they're, gonna, they're, not, they're not going to be leading it. And until they do lead it, you're not going to see huge transformations. So we're back to the question of, of residents and residents uh, themselves standing in the way of, of their own progress or certainly uh, neighbors would be looking over these green buildings and saying, oh, there's a flood, it's, it's always flooded over there, it never seems to work. Uh, it's back to changing the mindset of the people who actually live in these neighborhoods in order to, uh, to bring progress or some uh, improved circumstances really for all of us in these neighborhoods. It's all about becoming more aware and becoming more informed and talking more amongst the neighbors about what's happening in the neighborhood and how the neighborhood could be better. I think today with technology we've got an opportunity to do that more than ever. Um, I wish more people opted in and were more interested rather than just sitting back and waiting till their own self-interest is jeopardized. Um, I think, quite frankly, I believe there's a there's a connection between the way we've planned our, our communities in the last uh, in the last 50 years and and what I call civic disengagement. I think there's a, a huge connection between that. I think if we can move to planning our communities more thoughtfully and designing them more thoughtfully, we're going to encourage more social interaction and we're going to have people become more engaged in those communities. So I, I've always believed there's that connection there. I've tried to study that connection, I've tried to look at how people interact in. in in, in, um, in environments, physical environments that are well planned and, and physical environments that are not well planned. And I think if we can spend a bit more time as residents of the community being more aware of our surroundings, what makes a place feel good? What makes a place the kind of place you want to spend time and hang out in? And what makes a place feel bad? Where do you feel threatened? Um, where do you feel uncomfortable? Um, where do you feel uninspired? And if you compare those things, I think you'll start to reach some logical conclusions.